And so now let's take a step back and ask ourselves, so I'm rejecting these different superficial definitions of Christianity, practicing Christianity, going to church regularly, getting baptized. So what's my definition of being a Christian? I don't want to just give a random definition here. I think that we should go to the ultimate authority. Who's the ultimate authority? Jesus. How did Jesus define the true Christian? This is a question that's not, off, uh, that's not asked often enough. Matthew 7, 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. What is Jesus saying here? There's a tremendous statement. He said, just because you're, you're, you're calling me by my name and saying I'm a follower of Jesus doesn't make you a follower of Jesus and doesn't make you a true Christian. Do you understand my teachings? And more importantly, do you follow my teachings? Do you try to put my teachings into practice on a day-to-day -day basis? That and that alone is a true criterion of whether you are a true Christian. Jesus himself says it, and I think this is the best definition of being a Christian and practicing Christianity. Isn't this the whole point of Thomas Akempis' imitation of Christ? We should literally, as true Christians, try to emulate the life of Jesus. Live as he lived. Try to live up to his teachings, which are very, very demanding. What are those teachings? This would take multiple lectures, and so I'm just going to kind of uh, highlight some of the key teachings of Jesus. Matthew 20, 20, 22, 37. Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So let's take these two commandments one by one. In Vedantic terms, Jesus' most fundamental commandment was to try to love God, cultivate bhakti. What did Sri Ramakrishna do and what did he teach? Exactly that. One of the greatest bhaktas who ever lived. And he taught that the goal of life is to love God. Some people might say, but he didn't love the Christian God. He loved Hindu gods, but when Jesus says to love God, he means himself. First of all, we don't know that. He says, Jesus says to love God. He doesn't say to love me. Of course, he says he's the son of God, and that he's Jesus. But remember, Sri Ramakrishna did love Jesus. And he worshipped him as an incarnation daily from 1874 up to the end of his life. But the, the, the deeper point here is that, but Sri Ramakrishna will deny that presupposition that there's a difference between the Christian God and the Hindu God. That's the whole point of his teachings, that God is one, but different religious practitioners call that same God by different names, worship him in different forms. It's one God. Now, then you might say, well, Jesus was Christians. Christians believe that Jesus was the only incarnation, whereas Sri Ramakrishna believed in multiple incarnations. Hindus typically, yada, yada, hidharma, siaglani, bhavata, means Hindus believe that whenever there's unrighteousness, God will incarnate in human form. And so isn't that a conflict? First of all, Jesus never says that he's the one and only son of God and that he's the only incarnation. That's a dogma that develops centuries later. That's an important thing to keep in mind. And secondly, many Christians themselves reject the idea that Christ was the only incarnation. And some of them go so far as to say that it's not even true that Jesus was God, but they still call themselves Christians. What's an example? Uh, there are two uh, very prominent theologians, John Hick and Paul Knitter, who edited a volume called The Myth of God Incarnate. And a another one is called The Myth of Christian Uniqueness. And they're attacking this dogma. And they say that it's because fundamentalist Christians believe that Christ is the only incarnation that we've seen so much bloodshed and violence and sectarianism and bigotry in the history of Christianity. And so we need to renounce these kinds of ideas, these fundamentalist ideas. Um, 
What was Christ's second commandment? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Didn't Sri Ramakrishna practice this to a T? Sri Ramakrishna used to teach, Shib Gene Jibe Shiva. You should serve others in a spirit of worship by seeing God in everyone. And didn't he do this? Swami Vivekananda went so far as to say, in, in one of his lectures in the West, he says that, he quotes this teaching of Jesus's, love thy neighbor as thyself, and says, there is no way to understand the deeper spiritual and philosophical basis of this teaching without Vedanta. Because it's Vedanta, and specifically how I understand it, which is Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta, the idea that there's nothing but God. God herself manifests as each one of us sitting in this room as everything in this entire universe, everything and everyone in this universe. It's only on that basis, only on the basis of divine oneness that we can say, love thy neighbor as thyself. Why should we love our neighbor as ourself? Because the same God dwelling in me is dwelling in you and in my neighbor and everyone in this world. That's the Vedantic rationale, explanation of love thy neighbor as thyself. Holy Mother says the same thing in a very simple way. Learn to make the whole world your own. No one is a stranger, my child. The whole world is your own. And of course, I can't uh, overlook the Sermon on the Mount, some of his most famous teachings. A well-known Christian theologian named John R. W. Stott from Britain, he, says the he wrote a book called The Message of the Sermon on the Mount in 1973. He says the following about it. I think it's apt. He says, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably it is the least understood, and certainly it is the least obeyed. That last part I think is very important. What are some of these teachings from the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5.8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's pure Vedanta. Through spiritual practice, we purify our hearts. With what aim? With the aim of having direct realization of the divine. Isn't this exactly what Sri Ramakrishna did? Another teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.27. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. It's from the Old Testament, one of the Ten Commandments. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And who practices more perfectly than Sri Ramakrishna? Looking upon every woman as a manifestation of Divine Mother. Jesus teaches about how we should pray. This is from Matthew 6, 6, 5 to 6. He says, don't be like hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Rather, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret. Does this remind us of any of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings? Sri Ramakrishna in the gospel often contrasts what he calls the Rajasika Bhakta from the Sattvika Bhakta. He says the Rajasika person is the person who, in the middle of a large crowd, very kind of loudly and... Uh, uh, ostentatiously is engaging in spiritual practices. He's got a japa mala, uh, 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 rosary beads strewn with gems to attract more attention. And he's praying out loud and kind of in the corner of his eye looking to see whether other people are impressed with what he's doing so that they can bra say that, wow, oh, he's so pious and spiritual. By contrast, the sattvika bhakta, Sri Ramakrishna says, the person who, in the middle of the night, in his or her mosquito net, in India they need mosquito nets because of the mosquitoes, who are, which are ferocious, is engaged almost all night in spiritual practices. Nobody knows, might wake up late. People might say, you're, you're a lazy bum. And he won't say anything. He won't reveal his spiritual practices to a soul. Doesn't this tally nicely with what Jesus says? The hypocrites versus the true, the people who pray in a sincere way. Uh, Jesus says right after that, he says, also avoid vain repetitions. Don't just repeat God's name mechanically. That's not going to amount to much. Shankar says exactly the same thing. Hazra, the notorious Hazra, he's always doing japa. And he develops a superior complex because he thinks he does more japa than Rakhal, Brahman, and the Ji. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm greater than everyone because I'm doing japa all the time. And what happens? Sri Ramakrishna finally, he says, give me your mala, give me your rosary beads, let me try this. <laughs> You're doing this all day, let me see. And he, he takes God's name some two or three times and immediately goes into samadhi. 
And then he returns them all. He says, I don't know how you do this all day. <laughs> See, what does it mean? It means mechanical repetition. It's, it's, it's better than nothing, and it's good. And ultimately, through mechanical repetition, you want to bring as much bhava into it as possible. But of course, there are times when it's going to be mechanical. But the, the ideal needs to be moving from vaidhi bhakti to raga bhakti. These are the terms used by Sri Ramakrishna. Vaidhi bhakti is, I'm going through the motions, I'm doing things because my guru told me. Raga bhakti is, the practices come from within. I take God's name because I have this deep bhakti for God. I, I can't help but take God's name. It's part, of, it's part of my very nature. It's like breathing to me. Matthew 6, 24. Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon means what? Worldly prosperity, worldly riches, worldly possessions. Who is a greater renunciate than Sri Ramakrishna? Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. It's a very important teaching. It reminds me of something Sri Ramakrishna used to say. He says, if you keep writing zero after zero, that number will have no value. Until you do what? Until you add a one to the front of those zeros. And then it becomes a massive number with a, with a, with a huge value. What does that mean? He means make God your first priority. Make spiritual life your first priority. Make that the basis of your life, and then everything else shall be added unto you. It gives meaning to everything else in your life. It doesn't mean that you should become a monk and everybody has to be a monk. No. Have a spiritual basis, and then once you have that foundation strong, then you can freely live in this world and do everything as worship of God and as an offering to God. <laughs> 